Darren. Hang on. I'm, I'm checking my heart rate. <laughs> okay. I think it's finally come down from that LSU South Carolina game. <laughs> so we're, we're good to start. Are you ready to start? I, I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> okay. I have no current health alerts. That's, that's much different than Saturday. Yeah. Welcome I, back, everybody. It's the Brew and Shaver Sports Podcast, where we deal with everything pertaining to sports, including our heart rate, our blood pressure. <laughs> health concerns that happen to all of us during those games where we just lose our minds to watching our team. Wow. It's college football season. And would you have it any other way? Exactly. Exactly. It was a, uh, it was a day of excitement of, um, of um, mountaintop kind of moments, maybe for some teams and uh, deeps in the frozen depths of the Valley moments for other teams. But, Anyway, we don't have to talk about that. <laughs> it's hard to stay on the mountaintop, Darren, and it's it's yeah. it's it's a, it's a brutal fall. I'm it is sorry. a ugly, ugly fall filled with bumps and scrapes and breaks. That's exactly right. <laughs> but hey, Vanderbilt may come back. That you you had your one shining moment. You may get another one this season. You know, we're we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Some some theories that I'm working that that might help for next week, but. Anyway, I, I think it was oh gosh, is it Bart Sally? Bert, is that uh, Yahoo Barrett. Sports? Barrett. Barrett. There you go, mm-hmm. Barrett Sally. I believe it was him. I, I I might be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure it was him that said there's one consistent universal truth in football. Tweeted it out Saturday night. Vanderbilt will always disappoint. <laughs> And he might not be wrong, but anyway. <laughs> the agony, the agony. That, that's right. <laughs> Let's get into our week three takeaways from an incredible weekend of college football action. Let's jump right into it. Darren, what's your first takeaway from this past weekend? Uh, I think I'm going to quote uh, a movie to sum up my first takeaway. i just going to simply say, Oh, Billy, <laughs> Billy Napier is not having a very good, well, three years. I started to say 72 hours, but really, honestly, three years. I, you know, I will say, and, and I think I've brought this up just about every single time that we've talked about it, but just in, in the interest of fairness, we we thought this was a good hire. We saw uh, up close what he did uh, at, at UL Lafayette. Uh, you know, he, he had 40 wins uh, at UL Lafayette. His last three seasons were double-digit wins, and his last two seasons, he ended the year, uh, the team ended the year ranked in, in the AP and or coaches poll uh, with four consecutive bowl appearances. I mean, he was doing everything right. So there was nothing about it that made you feel like this was not going to be a good pick. Uh, are a good coaching hire, but it is, I mean, it's time to, to call it what it is. Uh, you know, I, the, the Billy Napier era in Florida is, is over. Uh, it's not a matter of if, but when, uh, you know, he's 6-11 in the SEC, 7-15 and against power four teams, 2-11 and against ranked teams. I don't know why. Well, you know, honestly, I say I don't know why. I think uh, when he is sitting back in a cabin on a lake somewhere, maybe in East Tennessee, since he you know, grew up in Cookville, uh, <laughs> when he's sitting uh, sitting on, on a lake after this is all said and done, I, I think one of the things that he might go back and take a look at is is the coordinator hires. I, I, no matter what adjustments you made in the D coordinator, hiring an analyst and Ron Rivera and all, like, none of that worked. And it probably would have been a better idea to, to hire a play caller instead of trying to be the play caller uh, when you're taking on a, a task the size of Florida. Uh, so those would probably be a couple of things. And when he was able to sit back and reflect, he'll go, yeah, probably should have done that differently. But there's just, you know, only 12 wins in, in three years. The time has come. They're, there's a commercial that they run during the game two or three times during the game when they play in Gainesville that is him doing um, like a, a public service announcement. And the, the story that's going around in social media, I've heard on a couple of podcasts today, is the boos were so overwhelming the first time they played it 
that they didn't even play it the other two times, that, that it was scheduled, that they pulled and said, let's just not even play that commercial. Uh, that's how kind of toxic it seems to have gotten in Gainesville. So I hate it because even the people that talk about how it's time for them to go that are there on the inside of the program or covering the program talk about the fact that you couldn't find a better guy. So hate it for Bill and Napier, but I, I, that's my first take watching the past weekend. What's what do you think the irony is if Florida loses in Starkville this weekend and Napier gets fired losing at the former school of Dan Mullen who <laughs> left Mississippi State to go to Florida he was fired and Napier was hired to replace him do you see any like irony there it's like a Shakespearean drama almost uh, here's here's what I'm willing to say what's the over under how many times Dan Mullen tweets about it well you think <laughs> If that ends up being what happens, I guarantee you Dan Mullen pulls the trigger on that one tweet that talks about it in some way. <laughs> guarantee. My, my first takeaway from the past weekend is South Carolina. I, I was skeptical about the Gamecocks. Uh, the week one, the struggle they had against Old Dominion was not exactly morale boosting or for anybody that's a fan. Then they came out and they throttled Kentucky, which surprised all of us. So LSU coming to town, I thought South Carolina would, you know, game day was there. It's a home game. Thankfully it wasn't a night game. It was a early game, which kind of surprised me, but it is what it is. I'm really impressed by the job that Shane Beamer is doing this year. He's got them ready to play. They were excited. They were playing out of their minds. Uh, They played a great football game against LSU and had the Tigers on the ropes. They were up 17-0 to at at one point. So I know we've been critical of Beamer in the past, but this year something seems to be clicking. Now, Lenora Sellers will keep an eye on him with that ankle injury. They've got Akron this week, so they don't have to – there's no – need to rush him back because you want him ready for the October 5th matchup against Ole Miss when the Rebels come to town. So, but South Carolina, now we're going to find out how good a job Beamer has done. They've got Ole Miss on October 5th. They go to Alabama on the 12th. They've got, they go to Norman to face the Sooners on the 19th. And then they got A&M coming to town on November 2nd. So is this just a, an aberration or it, is South Carolina much better this year? That was that was my takeaway from from this past week. I know South Carolina fans were disappointed in the outcome against LSU, uh, but the, they played a solid game for most of the game, and they had some big plays. I think LSU gave up what, five plays of twenty plus yards, including that seventy five yard touchdown run Oof. by Sellers, who looked yeah. fantastic. He's big, he's quick. The guy's got a tremendous upside. He's only a freshman, yeah. so I, I think. Uh, I'm waiting to see, but right now it appears that Shane Beamer is doing a really great job this year. I I think it's a great take. I think there are some obvious uh, deficiencies, some issues that they are going to need to overcome. Offensive scheme, backup quarterback, but I, I think they are. I think they're doing things as a team that accentuate their strengths and overcome their weaknesses and I think it's a great point that they're doing it on a level that coming out of the old Dominion game, we didn't see coming. So, <laughs> for sure. And, and there are questions about the backup Robbie Ashford. Yeah. But the, the good thing about Ashford, he's not going to be in the Heisman Trophy conversation. Right. But he has, an ex, he has experience as an SEC quarterback. He, yeah. He's played in these stadiums. He's been in these moments. That within itself is is extremely valuable. Absolutely. I, I think that's a great, another great point. How about your second takeaway? Well, this is kind of a amusing, I guess you could say, <laughs> that I've had uh, percolating in the brain for the last couple of days, watching how this season has developed so far. You know, we just talked about South Carolina. Week one, uh, what was a unreal really kind of a game against old dominion even if you didn't have the highest of expectations for south carolina you expected that game to go a little bit better and then they come out in week two and take on kentucky um then you see kind of the, the same thing with kentucky they have a great or a 
decent week one. We don't really know. I mean, there were you know what eighty-seven hour weather delays, and you know lightning struck the stadium six times, and everybody was oh whatever all the craziness was in, in Kroger Field that night. So you don't there was so much outside going on that you don't really know how that went, but it, or could have gone, but but it went well for Kentucky. Then so you have that success. They come off of success and look awful against South Carolina. You know what three completed passes or or what whatever it was. And then turn around and play Georgia the way they did uh, this week. We've seen several upsets already this season with Notre Dame, you know, getting beat by outside of the conference, but still Notre Dame getting beat by Northern Illinois. That horrible, what in the world happened, Mississippi State <laughs> Toledo game. Goodness gracious, Mississippi State fans. I, I, you have my heart. Believe me, I understand. <laughs> but watching all of that happen and seeing how big the upsets or the kind of scary the moments have been, and then the strength that teams rebound with, it, it's made me think. I wonder if, if an unintended consequence of the uh, NIL transfer portal era is teams don't have the chance to mature as a team and mature in the system, buying into the system as they used to have. Because now, I mean, just like how many teams have you heard, well, this team, you know, during the, the pregame uh, ramp up to the game, this team has 56 new players on the team. This team has 37 new players on it. This team has 60, whatever. With all of that coming in, that opportunity to mesh and gel and grow in the system and grow in belief in the system, that can't take place over a two or three years period the way it used to. So I, I'm wondering if what this year is showing us is that that maturing and, and gelling uh, process is happening through adversity. Your South Carolina, you absolutely take it on the chin in week one. Even though you come out of the win, you take it on the chin in week one then that kind of forces that growth as a team to grow up as a, as a, as a team for the first time as a collective group, because you've got so many new people, you get up and dust yourself off as a group and you have this new uh, vigor about you because you don't want to have that happen again. And that forces that growth that quickly, that sometimes happens naturally, or, or you, you depend on having naturally with a team that spends years together, two and three and four years together and I, and I think if you look kind of the way schedules have played out so far, I think we're seeing that. I think we're seeing that these teams are gelling, obviously, but not at the level they used to. And then when that adversity hits, it creates that moment. It's that, you know, pressure on the coal that creates a diamond, to use a very, very old, and I understand that, but a very, very old metaphor. And, and I think we're seeing that. I think we're seeing teams that can't be mature and handle success. Uh, a la Kentucky, take it on the chin, that adversity forces that maturity, that growing up a little bit, and then we see what they do against Georgia. I think we're seeing examples of that, not only in the SEC, but all over college football this year. And I think it's, I think it needs to at least be explored as an unintended consequence. It's not, not something you think about. You know, there are so many other levels to NIL and transfer portal. This is so far down. But I think it's something we're seeing kind of come to fruition this year, uh, that there almost has to be a, a take it on the chin kind of moment to force that gel and that maturity and that buy-in that may be missing on some level by the entire team. And then, then you see kind of a real positive next step after that adversity. Wow. That's, that's a lot of great insight, Darren. Well, here's the thing. Maybe where all that comes from is I'm hoping that um, Vanderbilt will take their adversity <laughs> this past weekend, use it as a moment to get up, dust themselves off, mature, and then show us something amazing against Missouri. I'm at least holding on to it. I'm holding on and hoping to see what, see what happens. <laughs> There's your angle. Everybody's got an angle. That's right. I, I knew yours was in there somewhere. <laughs> You got to hold on to hope. Well, I mean, what else do you have? You got to hold on to hope. <laughs> Absolutely. What's your second takeaway? I want to talk to the Oklahoma fans. You are a storied 
program. There's no question about it. You have been among the elites in college football for decade after decade after decade. You hit, hit some hard spot, hard points in the 90s, very difficult times, but you came out of that. You're now in the SEC, and it's time to prove yourself. No one cares about the history. No one cares about the wins. No one cares about the national championships. It's all about can you prove yourself now in the toughest conference in the country. You did what you were supposed to do already this year. You beat Temple. You beat Houston. You beat a gritty Tulane team. You were supposed to beat all those teams, and you did your job. Offensively, some questions, but certainly Jackson Arnold has shown sparks of the quarterback he could be. Defensively, you're playing pretty outstanding overall. That's going to be put to the test because here's the prove yourself games. Here's your next five games. Tennessee, at Auburn, Texas, South Carolina, Ole Miss. So you've got five in a row that are all, on paper at least, going to be tough games. This is your opportunity, Sooners, to show that you belong in the SEC, to show that, that you are an elite program and you can play at the highest level. I, Darren, I've said it repeatedly. I am thrilled. I, I'm on the edge of my seat waiting for this Tennessee-Oklahoma game. It's Absolutely. this Saturday, finally, this Absolutely. Saturday. It's going to be incredible. The first SEC game uh, in Norman, I can't wait. And OU, here's your moment. Here's your yep. spotlight. Seize it. I, that's a great point and a great takeaway. And I I think it just makes it even more exciting, man. I think this is going to be such a fun moment to watch this game, the build up, and then the kickoff, and then to watch the game take place there in Norman. It's going to be so much fun. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. How about your number three, Darren? Well, the, the Wisconsin-Alabama game, and, and let me be clear from the very beginning that I'm not saying that anybody did anything wrong, not even implying that, but I think we had a moment where we saw a clear, there has been a changing of the guard at Alabama <laughs> moment. Alabama gets the ball toward the end of the second half, and it was at a point in the game where if this is a Nick Saban, Alabama, they don't, I'm not saying that they would all of a sudden kneel it out of mercy or anything like that, but it would have been a non-aggressive play call moment or play calls. Uh, it was multiple plays moment for a Nick Saban team. Again, not saying that Kalen DeBoer did anything wrong, but it was not a settle in, see what happens, non-aggressive moment for a Kalen DeBoer Crimson Tide. It was a, this is an opportunity to put more points on the board. Let's go. And they did. Drove down, scored with, I think, 19 seconds left, <laughs> left in the half, put another touchdown on the board. And again, I, I'm not saying that it was anything wrong because it wasn't this aggressive you know, we're going to put them up, put 70 up before the end of the half. Or, you know, it wasn't just that kind of crazy scoring. But it was a moment where you see a difference in philosophy. And it, it, it was obvious, just one of those real eye-opening moments where, wow, Saban's not on the sideline. This is a different team, a changing of the guard, a different head guy, you know, a different COO, different head coach, whatever. It was just really kind of a, a glaring moment of, Wow, it's just things are just different now. <laughs> Instead of Nick Saban on the field, when they're there at home, they play on Nick Saban field because he's no longer on the sideline. That was one of the things that really stood out to me this past weekend. Well, in in the words of Steve Spurrier, it's their job to stop us from scoring. Exactly. <laughs> and I think Kalen DeBoer buys into some Steve Spurrier philosophy. <laughs> Hey, it's a big game. SEC Big Ten matchup. Yep. Uh, Luke, Luke Fickle is known for being a defensive-minded coach. Mm -hmm. Man, you don't you don't take your foot off the gas no. pedal in that situation. I, 
uh, you know, you score as often and as much as you can, but Absolutely. you're right. I, I can see what you're saying about the difference in philosophy, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that really is not, like I said, not that Nick Saban would have all of a sudden started kneeling at that point or anything, but mm. I, I think it would have been a different level of play call. You would definitely wouldn't have not have seen as much of a foot on the gas as you saw with the, the Kalen DeBoer approach. All right. What's your third takeaway? Let me talk directly to Mississippi State fans. Let's all take a collective sigh together, a deep breath. Hear this clearly. Rebuilding is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. You've got your man, Jeff Levy. He's been there for three games now. And I know it's probably... You, you probably hit all the emotions in that game against Toledo, that, that loss, uh, the anger, the, the grief, the blame, the, the bargaining. No one wants to get beat at home. No one wants to get blown out by a Mac team at home. And I know that's a horrible loss. It looks bad. It felt bad. Understand you brought in a guy, you gave him the keys to your program, and he has to get the pieces in place. And he doesn't have that yet. This rebuilding is going to take time. And I want you to hear that clearly because it doesn't get any easier for y'all. Uh, you, you've got a matchup uh, with Florida, a favorable matchup, I believe, a game that you could very well win. But then you go to Texas, you go to Georgia, You've got A&M coming to Starkville. You go to Arkansas. Look, there are no easy games in the SEC, and this ride may get a lot bumpier than it already is. So keep things in perspective. And, and I know this is tough because I'm part of a fan base where we're liable to fire a coach after two years. If he's not a I mean, we we fire coaches who won national championships. Exactly. So. More than once, but anyway. <laughs> but give him his his opportunity to put the pieces together. Mm-hmm. This is going to be a rough season. See past see past the disappointment of this year into what I believe is a brighter future for Mississippi State. I think that's a great point, especially in today's world where everything is so instantaneous. And when I say that, I'm not looking at overarching philosophical, just in today's football world, everything is so instantaneous with the transfer portal and the way coaches are are moving chess pieces, uh, you know, head coaches and coordinators for that matter, uh, to, to take a breath and just let it develop. Now, don't take the Vanderbilt approach. We're seven years in, you go, huh, this guy might not be the guy. We're not saying that. (laughs) But to say, take a breath, let it develop, let him build, that's a great, great point, great takeaway. Let's move into the next segment of the show, Four Down Territory, where we give you our sure thing pick of the week, our upset pick of the week, and our brown bag from last week. Let's roll, Darren. <laughs> Who's your sure thing pick of this week? Well, and I'm sure you'll have plenty to say, so I'll go ahead and bring it up. I am going to pick against Auburn, and they are going to lose at some point, and I'm just going to keep doing it till I get it right. So I'm going with Arkansas as my sure thing pick this week. I think they're going to head down to Jordan Hare, and they are going to come back with a win. I'm going Arkansas. Sure thing pick. Darren, you're like the guy that woke up every day and told people, I'm dying. I'm going to die. And some, <laughs> at someday he's going to be right. That's right. <laughs> Auburn is losing. That's my pick every week till I get it right. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> so, you got to be persistent. That's what you got to be. That's... This sure thing pick of the week for me was grueling. I went back and forth. Because I love, I love Boomer Sooner. I love da 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 da. But I have a feeling this week in Norman, we're going to hear a lot of mm. Rocky Top. Don't do it. <laughs> and I, I didn't play it out of deference for you, my friend. Thank you. I appreciate it greatly. <laughs> 
there was a part of me that wanted to pick OU as the op- upset pick. It's the first SEC game. It's a night game. It's in Norman. And then I look at this Tennessee defensive line. Oof. I'm like, wow. Yeah. Now, next week on the show, if OU pulls this off and upsets Tennessee, we're going to be talking about this. Absolutely. You know, um, ad nauseum. Absolutely. It, it's, but I, I think that right now at this stage, at this stage, Tennessee probably is a little bit better than Oklahoma. Like you said, it might be a little bit of a painful pick for Oklahoma, but I, for Oklahoma fans, but I think it's a pick that makes sense for sure. Yeah. All right. How about your upset pick of the week? Well, upset pick, I'm going into a co- couple of conversations we've had in the process of this show so far. I think when you look at Florida and you look at Mississippi State, as you pointed out, Mississippi State is building. And as I pointed out, Florida is not. <laughs> And I think that shows up in this game. Mississippi State's a five and a half point favorite, or Florida is a five and a half point favorite, but it is in Starkville. And and I, I believe in the Mississippi State fan base. I think they're going to show up with the Cowbells. I think it's going to be an incredible environment, just like it always is. And Mississippi State pulls off the upset win, even because, to go back to my one of my other takeaways, they've had their moment of adversity. They're going to grow. They're going to mature just like Vanderbilt, and they're going to have this incredible moment where they beat Florida. I'm wholeheartedly believing in Jeff Levy and the Bulldogs. All right. I like that pick. My upset is I'm I'm going with, uh, you mentioned the Arkansas-Auburn game already. I'm going to go with the Razorbacks pulling out a victory uh, down in in Jordan Jordan Hare Stadium. I, I think Bobby Petrino is looking forward to a matchup against another Offensive mind and Hugh Freeze. I think he's going to have a great game plan for the Razorbacks on the offensive side of the ball. I think defensively, Arkansas is going to do some stuff. Auburn's got a freshman quarterback, and he he threw for four touchdowns against New Mexico, had a great debut. But now you're playing an SEC team. Arkansas, I, I wonder last week with the UAB, why it was so close, is they were already looking ahead to SEC action. All right, we got to play UAB. Let's get this game over with, and yep. then we got then we got SEC. Now's your chance. You're going down to Auburn. It's going to be a big game. I think the Razorbacks pull this out. Nice. How about your brown bag from last week? Okay, this is not going to be popular with South Carolina fans, but truth is truth. My brown bag for this week or for last week is the South Carolina fan base. Let's let go of the referees cost us the game narrative. I mean, you were up by 17 and let it go. Your starting quarterback was hurt. You, there were a lot of factors. Louisiana or LSU woke up. There were a lot of factors that led into that game going the way it did. Some might even say, your head coach choosing to just kind of let the clock out and not run one more play to get the kicker closer. There were a lot of factors that went into the end result of that game. I I get it that you didn't like some of the calls, especially the offensive pass interference. I've heard that in a lot of different places today. I get it. But when you're up 17 to nothing and you let that lead go, you can do a lot of things, but blame the refs is not one of them. Brown bag for the South Carolina fan base. You've got to let that narrative go. It's just not there. There, I said it for you. (laughs) That was a tough loss. And Darren, we talked before about we both grew up playing sports. And I remember a coach told us never, ever let the referees decide a game. Yeah, exactly. In every game – just about every game you look at, you can say, okay, here was a missed call. Mm-hmm. Boy, what were they thinking here? That was the wrong call. How yep. could that be a catch? How was that not a catch? Where where was that flat? Where was that penalty? I never saw that penalty. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's a part of the college football experience that we complain about the officiating. Absolutely. It's a part of it. But take care of, of business. And 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 I, look, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here because there are times where I will just – look at the TV in disbelief and, and yep. think, well, that, that call is going to cost us the game. Uh, so there's a lot of emotion, especially after you lose a game and you're stewing over blowing the lead. Uh, as an LSU fan, I can relate to that. Yep. 
but you're right, Darren, you're right. And it starts with um, what we teach little kids, you know, go out and, and play the game. Players play the game. Exactly. And don't worry about the officiating and the calls. Yep. You go out and take care of your business. Absolutely. So I think that's a, that's a great point, Darren. Great take on, on so many different levels. Yeah. <laughs> Why, well, thank you. What's your brown bag? Who's your brown bag pick for the week? Mississippi State, I told you rebuilding is a process. <laughs> Still, Toledo, 41 to 17. Uh, that that was that was painful to, to watch. And so hopefully there's no more of those brown bags the rest yeah. of the way. I think that um, with the, the lineup you have here, uh, you know, playing tough and still losing no one's going to look on that and say but boy this uh oh gosh and, and then the toledo coach running his mouth about the sec yeah so but it is what it is he his team won so he has the right to to say that stuff he's having his moment yep so uh you can go back to ohio into obscurity way up there anyway <laughs> um but anyway that's my brown bag for the week Great, unfortunate, but great brown, brown back. That leaves one more part to four down territory, and that is the post game quote of the week. Darren, you never disappoint. What do you got for us this week? Well, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about Texas this week with them taking over that number one spot. So I, I thought we would join in the conversation, but it's not necessarily about Texas's ranking. It's uh, some comments that uh, Coach Sark had to say about his. Uh, their incredible backup that had a pretty good week in Arch Manning. That's just kind of who Arch is, though. You know, he's he's um, he's just a normal guy that plays quarterback at the University of Texas. You know, and the name on the back of his jersey is one thing, but who he is as a teammate, I think, is another. And he just wants to play really good for all the guys around him. You know, that he, he, if he goes in there, he wants to make sure we keep moving the football because they're all counting on him to do that. And so that was the play, and he ran it, you know, and it wasn't just some aha moment. I think the aha moment was when he tucked it and ran for the touchdown. That was kind of like, whoa, I think he got his, his grandpa's athleticism. You know, I don't know if he got his uncle's. <laughs> Do you notice how relaxed Sarkeesian seems? Yeah. Well, I mean, you're having the kind of year they're having, and when you're – when you're should be a part of the Heisman conversation, starting quarterback goes down, you bring in Arch Manning. That's got to make you sleep a little bit better at night, right? <laughs> they have an abundance of wealth at quarterback. Absolutely, in many positions, but especially at quarterback. <laughs> Scary good. Yep. Be sure to hit that like button, that subscribe button. Stay up to date with everything that comes out from the show. It's all free content and we will let you know if you are a subscriber, you are notified anytime something is released. We appreciate you so much for following us, for joining in in the conversation and, and sharing the love of college football that we have, particularly SEC football. Yep. New episodes every Tuesday. That's what the screen says. So we'll see you next Tuesday. Until then, y'all take care. Have a great week. Thank you for making the Brew and Shaver Sports Podcast your go-to sports show. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our show if you haven't already. Your feedback is so important. Let us know what you think about this week's show. Send an email to brewandshavers at gmail.com or a text to our text line 318-390-3599. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you again for listening to the Brew and Shaver Sports Podcast. See you next week.